everybody, it's Carter, and welcome to this episode of Making It Up, the conversation series where I uh, talk to writers of all sorts of different types. And I know I know, I always start <laughs> every episode saying I talk to writers of all different types, and then you listen and you're like, oh, okay, it's another thriller writer, or it's another mystery writer, or another suspense writer. Um, but um, I do get writers of all types, and today I had the pleasure of talking to somebody who doesn't write mystery, suspense, or thrillers. I talked to Amy Wineland, Wineland, sorry, Amy Wineland Daughters. So Amy, first of all, is awesome. We had a fantastic conversation. Um, how to describe Amy? Uh, her writing, she probably can be best described as a humorist, uh, maybe a memoirist. Uh, she, uh, and, 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 and a huge college sports fan, particularly college football. She's got an interesting journey where she's, she's, she's always been the funny person. Um, maybe never quite knew what to do with that. Always been the sports person. And, and she found herself in a place where writing about, um, kind of sports blogging before there were blogs, uh, turned into a real thing for her. Um, and she became popular and known for doing that. And, and then like most writers, she had that thought one day of like, Hey, maybe I could write a book. It was actually a goal of hers after college. Um, but the idea of actually pursuing what to write about and how do I write what I want to write about? How do I write something funny? Because that's what I like to do. Um, that also is entrenched in, um, you know, real life emotion and real life experience. And so that became her book, Dear Dana, which actually may now become a movie, which is very cool. And then she wrote a second book, Cannot Mess This Up, A True Story That Never Happened. Um which has won all sorts of different awards and she's now <laughs> known for going out and, and, and doing keynote speeches based on her experiences. So she's a fascinating person as, as, as has her hands in a lot of different things. Um, a lot of varied interests, uh, and her story and her journey from being, um, kind of a business major to being a, a published writer is fascinating. So, um, I really enjoy talking to her. I can't wait to see what comes next from her. And I would love to see her book, um, Dear Data, become a movie. That would be that would be awesome. So I think you're going to like this one. This is my conversation with Amy Wineland Daughters. Hi, Amy. Hey, Carter, how are you? I am well. How are you? Living the dream. Are you? Excellent. <laughs> Absolutely. I could tell myself that all the time. <laughs> well, you know, there's there's that power of uh, positive thought, which I actually believe in, um, but it doesn't always work. <laughs> yeah, I believe in it too, but you're right. It's not foolproof. <laughs> like, why isn't it happening now? I, I started thinking <laughs> good things 10 minutes ago. <laughs> I've been thinking good thoughts for an hour and this is all crap. <laughs> <laughs> where where? So where do you live? Where are you right now? I'm outside of Houston, Texas. Oh, I, I, I say that uh, weather-wise, not yeah, because we're on the we're on the surface of the sun, Carter Wilson. Yeah, like, this yes. is the hottest. It was 109 here yesterday. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Yeah, my my son just. Uh, I'm in Colorado. My son okay. just went off to college, um, freshman year at LSU. So he's in Baton Rouge, and yeah, it's just like a festering mess down there of, of, oh. of heat and humidity. Well, great story, Carter. My son is a senior in high school, and the only college visit we went on was LSU. That's the only place he's ever wanted to go to school. Oh, so wow. we, so I will be joining you in out-of-state tuition if all things go as planned next year. So yeah, yeah. Oh, I, and it's crazy. The, it's like really, it's fifty thousand dollars a year out of state, but it's like almost free if it's in. <laughs> right. And you really want to go here? Why do you want to go here? <laughs> well, that's it. And you know, in Colorado and in Texas, there's so many great schools, mm -hmm. and. Uh, why are we going to, but it's hilarious because that's the only visit we're going on apparently. Yeah. And so, but good for him. He's a good kid. And you know, well, that's where he wants to go. Well, a weekend and uh, you know, it's mostly thumbs up. Although he called me about 10 minutes before this podcast and said a uh, funny story. I can't really uh, smell or taste anything. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Is that uh, your first one to go? No, my daughter's a junior at Michigan state. So they're both, they're, they're, they're both out of state. Tuition. But they both got scholarships, so that helped out immensely. Well, you know what the weird connection between Michigan State and LSU is? It's Nick Saban. Oh, that's true. Both places. And that's when he true. left, 
Michigan State. I have a really good, I'm a big sports fan. I have a really good friend who went to Michigan State. And when he left for LSU, those people lost their minds and they, they and they don't like him of course they don't like him anymore but anyway right. that's a weird connection two schools that really hate nick saban because they left him right and neither of them really care but yeah about that but right oh, so, okay my, my kids don't either so are you, are you from texas yes i'm from texas we've lived um around we lived in ohio we lived in in the uk okay. so i'm a, i'm a yeah i'm i've had the benefit of a much more you know diverse uh you know, experience outside of yeah. Texas, which is good for Texans, really. Right, right. Uh, although maybe it doesn't happen as often as it should. Uh, <laughs> no, of, I agree. Yeah. But a lot of people in general never really leave their area. And it's always, I had the same experience as you. I traveled extensively, uh, not only, you know, growing up, but but as an adult, I moved in a lot, of, I lived in a lot of different places. And it's, it's crazy how beneficial that is to understand, you know, just worldview. <laughs> No, it is. It makes you a better citizen, I think, you know, for sure. I feel like my kids and I and my husband, we, you know, it really has, you know, it does change. And it's something that's hard to explain to somebody who hasn't, you know, I believe. Yeah. It develops your empathy, which is, I think, a foundation of writing in general. Um, You know, just having that, that ability to kind of connect to readers because you've had those life experiences. You can, you can embody a character that, that is relatable, hopefully, uh, right to people did you now growing up in texas did you did you have any I, and i know you're not a novelist necessarily and you have a lot of different you, your your background is varied and but it's all kind of rooted in in, in creative arts um did you were, were you exhibiting signs of that a, a, as a kid and wanted to manifest that into something or were you just like most of us, a goofy kid who didn't know what you want to do with your life. Yeah, I was a goofy kid who followed my sister and brother into band. Like I played the saxophone and I was I was not good, but I really had a passion for being not good at it, apparently. Uh, yeah. But yeah. but you excelled at being terrible. Yeah, I excelled at wanting to be better. I've always excelled at being very competitive without excelling at anything, which is a great, <laughs> that's a great, for, you know, right. right. It's because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm completely committed to being bad at things. Right. But the whole time I grew up, I would, you know, on the side, I would write. I would write funny stuff. I would I would always want to. And then I was the girl who worked who reread her email 17 times because I thought it was hilarious or really right. good, you know. So I've always leaned towards that. But I didn't. We moved to the UK and I had to leave my job and my husband kept his so we'd have that opportunity and I didn't have a work piece. And that's when I sat down and I was like, ah, this is my chance, you that's know, and I started to really write. And then that's how that kicked off my real pursuit in writing well and, and humor is such an interesting thing so i'm a big comedy fan and i always have been I, a massive fan of stand-up and i remember seminal moments like listening to like eddie murphy's delirious on vinyl as a 14 year old and just over and over and just you know crying at how funny it was and so i've always i've always been interested in in comedians and humorists and and it's so it's so interesting to me because humor is something that it is hard to have perspective on about yourself. So, like you said, reading the email seventeen times, this is really good, but you still need that feedback to know if it is actually really good or if you're just like not as funny as you think you are. Right? So were you were you told? I mean, I'm sure you probably as a kid you were told like you had to say, you had a good sense of humor. Oh you were yeah, quirky. You were you were the class clown, et cetera, et cetera. Right. I was all that, and I was you know. Uh, yeah, awkward too, which helped, you know, to be, you know, awkward and funny is, is a funny combination. And, right. you know, my, my first book, I wrote myself back in time, thought I, I wouldn't really even, the whole writing thing is since it didn't come, you know, I wasn't educated as a writer. I've got like a business degree. And so I kind of just have messed around in it, except for the sports writing. That's the one thing that has always been more serious for me. And so I wrote this book and I wrote myself back in time. It was supposed to be a humorous time travel novel where I was going to go back in time and visit my family home for 36 hours and be the same age as my parents. And there's my 10 year, 10 year old wacky self. And, you know, and it, it's really funny, but there's so much underlying emotion that I got to weave into this humorous. And it turned out, I mean, I, you know, I just reread it because I have somebody who wants to pick it up or is interested in doing a movie. And so I was really, uh, you know, it's funny, but this whole wave of emotion, I think there's a lot of emotion with humor anyway. Those things are very tightly aligned. Yeah. You know? Totally. And, and and humor 
on its own, you can only stand for so long, right? Like if, right. I, if I watch a stand-up who's just shotgunning one-liners, I get bored in three minutes. Um, right. It is that 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 emotion woven through that makes it relatable and that makes the humor more poignant, I think, and more impactful. Uh, but that's I think that's the hard thing to do uh, for to to you know, the, the the best humorous you know, and the best memoirists who write from a humorous angle really kind of nail that where where at the end of it you're left feeling kind of like connected rather than just feeling like you laughed a lot. Right, and that's the whole. The whole I laughed, I cried, and then that's a hard thing to hit, though. You yes. know, I laughed, and to to really, and then when I looked at that book too, it made me realize I've been trying to be funny my whole life, and this little girl, this crazy like bug eyed bowl cut little girl, you know, it's just that that whole thing. I I've been working the same, you know, thing, the whole same shit for you know fifty years, and it's yeah. there's something beautiful about that. It's just more. I wouldn't even say it's more refined now. She might have something on me. Well, no. <laughs> right, right, totally, <laughs> and 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 it's also different having a sense of humor and knowing what you're good at writing. Those could be totally disparate things. So, for example, like you know, I'm considered a pretty funny person, but I don't write a lot of humor. I write very dark shit. Right, I and, read and, your stuff. And yeah. oh, okay, and but you know, I might inject some humor, but then it becomes very obvious when it's like, okay, this this stands out. And not necessarily in a good way. It looks like you're trying too hard. Um, you know, so maybe my newsletters will be funny, but like well, not, not my books, because I just don't think that's my strength. No, I agree. I've read. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I agree. But it's but that's interesting. I had that in my second book's more serious and it's more of a memoir. It's a story that I didn't intend to happen. But my editor, she was like, OK, that's funny. But, you know, we got to take that out because that's not really the place for this, you know, because that's what I want to do. I want to twist everything into something that's comical. Right. And it's almost a defense mechanism. And that's another part about being funny. You right. know, it's that's it's, all it is, really. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, wait, wait, you know, don't really look at me because I'm right. going to say this other stuff to, to divert your attention from who I really am. Right. You know? Right. You know, right. but that's funny about your writing, though, because your your stuff is very deep. And like you said, it's dark, but it's like, you know, very to me, it's there's a lot of thinking involved, and so you almost have to stick with that, and you can't pull the humor in to divert people from what you're really good at, though, is the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, that, I feel like the best writing comes from a place of, of emotion, whatever that right. emotion is. Um, but I, I feel like when I'm writing, I'm always asking myself, well, how is this character feeling? What are what are they thinking and what are they feeling right now, rather than what are they doing? Um, because that propels whatever it is that they're doing, but it's not kind of the start of it. So I, 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 I'm curious. Okay. So, so you got a business degree, um, and you did all that for however long, and then you ended up in the UK and you couldn't work, uh, cause you didn't have a work visa. So, and I love these stories because I feel like there's a through line for so, so many writers are like circumstances dictated that I knew I was a writer at heart, but I always shied away from it because I knew it wasn't practical. But then something happened that I said, well, if I'm ever going to do it, this is the time. And it kind of sounds like that's what happened to you in the UK. What was your first, like, like how did that manifest itself? You said, did you just start writing a, a, a book or you were trying to break into something else? Well, I just started writing, you know, I've always kind of, I think, been a columnist at heart. Like if I could you know, there's not many of those people out there now, though. And so I just started writing little pieces and I was like, I bet I could sell these to somebody or I could send them. And this is when, you know, we were going right between dial up and and regular. Internet. Right. So this is pre blog. Well, because right. you're basically was... talking about blogging. Right. No, exactly. And so I just started sending stuff like to the hometown newspaper and, you know, and then I was like, oh, people will either pay me or not pay me for this. But it fills something inside of me. And that's kind of how I got traction. Then when I got back, I had a friend was like, you know, you ought to write some of your like opinion pieces about college football. And I was like, oh, so I started doing that. And then I was like, then I realized I could get that picked up even easier because I'm a girl and I know a lot about football. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's I didn't. Yeah. And so then I got picked up by the Bleacher Report. Then I started doing it for oh. real. And then it just kind of took off. And then once you start, and I'm sure this is a similar, once you start believing like, like you said at the beginning of this conversation, you just need a little bit of validation to let you know, like, you know, you can do this. You can, you can, you know, be in this arena and um, not so much be successful, but, you know, have a voice and, you know, there's a, there's a place for you in this. And so I really started 
gaining traction. And that's what led to me to do some freelancing, some more serious freelancing. And then I was like, huh, I bet I could write a book. And, you know, and I, and, and so that's how the book thing happened, but it took five or six years to do that because again, I, I didn't take myself super seriously at the, you know, through most of that. Right. Well, then that's an easy thing for a writer to do is to never take themselves seriously because first of all, you're not making much money in that. I feel like for better or for worse, that's always like the mental bellwether of like, whether you should take yourself seriously is like, okay, I'm getting paid X dollars for these, for these pieces to the bleacher report, which is great, but Am I, you know, thriving on this? Probably not. Um, and that's what most writers are like. So it's very easy to be self-dismissive, right? Um, and which is kind of, I think, a shame because I think that's what holds up so many writers. And, and you know, I teach this all the time. Like, just even calling yourself a writer is such a hurdle because you're like, well, I'm not doing this full time, so I'm not a writer. And it's like, well, <laughs> you know, you got to give yourself a little bit more credit than that. But so I'm I'm curious when you're writing these these sports pieces, which must be great because it's just like, hey, this is my opinion. I don't have to fact check anything. This is just my observations. Um, you know, was that just a regular like you were you were contractually you know, hired by Bleacher Report and other sites to just uh, like weekly you're submitting pieces? Right at the beginning, I you know, I when I I did I was. You know, I had a contract with the Bleacher Report where I was doing three or four pieces a week mm -hmm. for a long time. Um, and then, yeah, and then I'm really a numbers girl. So I became kind of like the the stats girl. Like I have a spreadsheet on everything. Mm -hmm. And then when I, when the first book came out, I took a step back from it and then got back in and I analyzed football schedules for like four or five years. And uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, that's, that's what I did. And, uh, but like like you said, it was what you said is really poignant about do I call myself a writer, even though this is what I'm, you know, doing? Because I think it took me a long time, even past the first book, where I really considered like this is who I am. Like I yeah. can say I'm a writer. Yeah. So. Interesting. Yeah, totally. Well, and I'm also curious, you know, sports sites are, you know, really known for having horrible commenters, right? Like, you know, you're putting yourself out there and, and, and you're a woman and you're, you're opining on, on, on sports, which shouldn't be a, a thing at all. It should just be like, okay, this is just a person. But I'm curious to know, did you, did you, you know, how are the comments? Were, did you receive a lot of negative feedback or, or just unbridled misogyny because people are assholes or? Oh, it was across the board, but I yeah. had to, you know, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a sensitive person at the, you know, sure. and, you know, I, and that's, I, I don't know if that's part of it, being a writer or a creative person for everybody, but I know I'm sensitive and I had to learn. That was one of the biggest things for me. And, oh yeah. I got hammered for being a girl. But then when you go and look at the bigger picture of the sports world, it is, uh, everyone gets hammered yeah. and, it, and it was just something for them to say, you know, but it really in the, in the 15 years I've done this, it's changed so much, yeah. you know, and, and I, and the other thing is you establish yourself. You know, and you become credible because I, I'm big on if, if I'm going to give you a number that it's going to be right. And one thing I did at the very beginning is I would at the end of pieces, I would say I basically linked to where I would get my statistics. Like these are the sites I use. And it kind of shut people down because it was like, well, that wasn't the win loss record of Wisconsin in 2003. Well, yeah, it was. Go look it up. I mean, right. I'm not, you know. Right. You think I'm just making this up and putting it on this like really right. popular sports website? <laughs> And that's why that's when it's easy to say you're a girl, but that but that's easy to say if I was short, they could say that, or if I True. was if I was heavy and I was a guy, I could say that, or if I was and that's why I started to realize it wasn't so much about me being a girl. It really was a bigger benefit for me, I think, than it ever was mm -hmm. a detractor. And then once you got a group of followers, this is actually the first season I haven't written about college football since mm -hmm. since way back then. I and, and because I've got these other two or three projects working and I just decided to take one season off, which is super weird because it starts this weekend. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That is weird. That's got to be like an almost like an empty hole in your life where you're like, so, so you're still, are you still following it? You're still writing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm obsessed, you know, but we're, you know, but I, it's one thing had to go. So I feel a little lost right now, but I, you know, I feel good about it because it's going to, it'll free me up to do, because I'm in a position where I could do a few more things now and it will, it will free me up for that. But did yeah. you do like annual like previews and stuff like that where you're like, by now I would have published this piece that I do every year? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like that. Yeah. Because since I analyze schedules, I would be like, you know, the 30, you know, 15 amazing facts about this year's schedule. And then I wrote 
for the last several years, I've written a viewing guide. Like there's hundreds of games. Here's what sure. you should watch. Oh, wow. So every week, that was the rhythm of my week. I did other stuff, but it was like on Monday, I look at all the stats and I look at all the replays. On Tuesday, I look at next week's games and the matchups. On Wednesday, you know, th that's what I did. So. Right. So, so tell me about the, kind of that journey from writing, uh, you know, about college football short form to, hey, I think I can write a book. Was the idea there first or was the thought of writing a book kind of the thing that compelled you? No, I think I think just being a writer, I've always thought maybe I'll write a book. Like I wrote goals when I graduated from college. I was like, I'll, I'll write a book. That's one of my goals. It's you a know. goal to have. Right. And I don't know, like anything else, I'm a big goal setter. I'm a big dreamer. So I have lots of things I've written down to do. But so the idea came first. I'm obsessed with the past, like the Sears catalog. I'll sit and read it in bed for two hours, you know, like mm -hmm. metal detecting, you know, mm -hmm. eBay. That was all up my, and I love history. That's, that's, that's my genre of reading that I enjoy and uh, historical fiction. Love it. And so I was like, I'll, you know, and I came up with the idea, I'll write myself back in time to 1978. I'll be dropped off at my parents' house. And I, and I kicked it around, kicked it around. I started playing with it. We had small kids at the time. You know, I took a weekend away and went to like some 70s lodge and with all the videos from us growing up and the pictures. And I sat there and tried to, try to like, you know, manifest, manifest myself back in time. So I started writing this book. But it took years. It took a couple of years to write the book. And then you're a author, you know this. The process of getting a book published when you're nobody is, you know, I mean, that's that's trying to get an agent because I read everything about what to do, you know, and then just the process. I don't, I didn't, I didn't believe in the the project, the book. I remember getting on the phone with an editor I was working with. I was like, so do you think it's a real book? She's like, like, are you serious? And I was like, yeah, like, it's really a real book. And she was like, yes, it's a real book. Like we're doing this editing process together. I know that sounds crazy, but you know, the whole time I questioned myself, like what, because I, I, I believe part of it's because I wasn't trained to be an author or a writer, you know, and the other side of it, that's, it's a, that's, it's a big, it's a big goal. And I don't, I don't know that I, I just didn't feel like I was legitimately, you know, part of that until probably well after the book was published. So. Yeah, I think that's a very common feeling. I'm the same way. I was never trained and I just started writing one day. And so, you, yeah, you go through all that. Like, I don't even know. Like, I just rem I remember like the idea of like creating a new chapter was like, is there a rule about when I stop a chapter and started? I, I had no idea. I'm like, maybe I'm doing this all wrong. I have zero clue. And so, yeah, of course you're going to have imposter syndrome uh, for years and years and years until you get some kind of external validation over and over and over again that tells you that, that you're not terrible. And, right. and even then you still struggle with it. So it, Oh, it, yeah. Yeah, that's part of the creative process. Like, this is great. And then you're like, oh, my God, this is crap. This is horrible. And then you come back around, you're like, oh, maybe it's okay. And they're like, I never want to see it again. Well, and there's also the thing of like, you know, it can't be a real book if I wrote it. <laughs> like, no, you're right. You know, and I'm not saying it's not hard because it is hard, but it's like the fact that you accomplish it, accomplish it, then you kind of think like, well, if I did it, then I must have done something wrong uh, because it, because it seems before you start like such an unattainable thing. It's like saying like, I'm going to write a symphony and, you know, you write some musical notes. Like, is this a symphony? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's beautiful. No, and I think that's really, I mean, that really hits home with me. Because, you know, that is, and I think sharing that on, uh, you know, and that's what you do here with this podcast, that's really, I think that's going to help a lot of people who were in the position we were getting started, you know, like that's a, that's a common feeling. You're good. Just keep going. Right. I, you know, like I didn't know where to, that whole chapter thing, that's beautiful. Like, am I doing it wrong? And I tell people all the time, and I'm sure you get this, you're way more accomplished than I am, but you know, what do I do? Well, there, I always say you can't do anything wrong. Just sit down and start writing. And I right. just watched your little post with your with your little hand saying, you just got to get in there and do it for 15 minutes a day. Right. Right. You know, just get in there and do it. And that's the whole thing. Right. It's not rocket science. And whatever it takes you to get to the table, that's what you got to do. Procrastinate for 45 minutes. You know, do whatever you got to do. Right. To get to the table. Yeah, I think the only thing you can do wrong is not finish it. You know, and I think, you know, so many people stop themselves because it's not good enough or it's got to be absolutely perfect or uh, you're second guessing yourself and they get 20,000 words into something and then they start something new, 20,000 words. And it's just like, just, just accept that it's not going to be good. Right. And initially, 
but get it done because getting it done is the hardest thing to do. Uh, totally. And it comes alive in the editing. And, and and at some point, then you just let it go and you're like, well, okay, I, I, you know, and you just keep building like anything else. You learn and you get better. And, you know, it might take multiple, multiple, multiple books that never sell to get to a place where you finally get published. And, or you might not ever be published because it's right. really hard to do. But, you know, it's so easy to have a mental block stopping you from all of that. So, you said it took you it took you several of the years to write this first book, and then you went down the necessary rabbit hole of figuring out how do I. So, so you talked about getting an agency. So was there the idea in your head of like maybe you would self publish it, or you really wanted to go the traditional route and get that affirmation that it was oh, worthy of being I, published? Right. No, and that's what took me so long because I never got an agent. Uh, I hybrid published the first book. Yeah, and. Uh, I'm really proud of it. And it, it turned out to be uh, a good, you know, experience. Um, and I'm proud of it. But yeah, I wanted to be traditionally published. You know, I wanted all the, you know, and that's part of, and you know that as an author, that's part of the whole thing is we, you know, you feel like you're looked down upon if you don't take this traditional route and, you know. And, yeah, although that's kind of changing. That's. I think you're right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there are a lot of people who have seen tremendous success self-publishing. I think. I think I think that the dividing line is is how much awareness you have of what you're doing because if you and this is my opinion if you self publish simply because you've been rejected so much that might be a mistake you know right. you might be you know you might want to think okay, why is this but I'm interested with your book because you're you know you know your first book doesn't necessarily fit a lot of you know. Uh, categories where it's like, okay, we're looking specifically for this type of book. Um, was that like, were you getting feedback like that from agents of like, you know, I like this, but it's just, I, I don't know how to sell it. No, for sure. And, and when you say time travel, th there's, there's <laughs> half the crowd wants sci-fi. Right. And, right. And right. Other... Nothing humor related. Right. No, and nothing like feelings.com, like women's you know, fiction, because that's kind of what it is, you know? Yeah. And so, no, it didn't have a, a, a true genre because some of the reviews I got, I got a review from a sci-fi guy was like, oh my God, this is the worst thing I've ever read because I, I want you to explain how you went back in time. Like right. he wanted- yeah, Like you're that. not my audience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, and so that was even the publicist had a hard time knowing what to do with it. Like where, what audience do we put this in? Sure. And I think that was absolutely the, the feedback I got. Like, like, we love it. We think it's great. But we don't we don't know what to do with it. We don't have a place for it. But then once you've written the whole thing, I felt like I had I it deserved and it and it, it found a great audience. And like I said, if you know somebody wants to make a movie about it, so yeah, who that's amazing. Seen, who would ever seen that coming? Right. You know, right. I, I don't know if that'll actually happen, but that just blows my mind. Yeah. And it goes back to what you said. I didn't give up on it. Right. You know. I mean, that's the whole thing. Um. So then, what was your journey for your second book like? Uh, I got a lot more interest because I already had a book that had done okay. Okay. You know? And so I still didn't get an agent. I just got a different deal, you know? Yeah. So, and, and that's a, that's a risk too of silver hybrid publishing is once it's out there, it's out there. And if you're shopping something else out, all those publishers can look at your numbers. Yeah. Um, so if it totally sold two copies, yeah, you know, that's worse than not having had that first book out at all. Oh yeah. So it was, so, uh... so it's good that yours did, did moderately well. So like it attracted attention. Right. No. And it did. And it did well. And I've had people tell me that despite the fact that <clears throat> like, what is it? Because I the way I explain the first book is it's a it's a fiction book or, you know, rolled in like a burrito of a nonfiction book or the other way around, because it is, cause it's, it's a bunch of real stuff presented as fiction and time travel makes it, you know, the ultimate fiction. Right. 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 But but something like time travel can just be a device that takes up five percent of the book. Right. Right. And, and and the rest of it could be very much a memoir uh, with right. just that one element in there where it really isn't kind of a book. So, it, it, yeah. And it's it's so interesting to see over time how important the ability to pitch your book is to whomever, how they and how they receive it is totally different than what you would think, because they're thinking about how do I market this? How do I sell this to booksellers? What is and I would hear this from my editor. I'm like. What is the pitch? What is the angle? What is the one sentence that's going to hook somebody? And and if your book is kind of obtuse, uh, then that's hard to do. But on the other hand, you don't want to be just writing very basic, 
you know, uh, commercial fiction that only has a simple hook, but not much of a story. And then there's a fine line between those two things, you know, <laughs> well, sure. You know, like this is super interesting, but it's too interesting that I struggled, you know, in writing the query letters at the beginning, sure. you know, how, how do I do this in a sentence? And it's really, I mean, it's a book like that, the, the, the first book, it was really hard because it was like, you know, mm, you know, you know, because as soon as you say time travel, I think people think one thing, you know, and I would, but, but then, yeah, it's, it's just hard to encapsulate in one sense. And that was, and then hence my problem. Right. Totally. And, it, and it's funny because I always preach, you know, write what you want to write because that's how you actually get stuff done because you're enjoying it. Right. But, but, you know, the reality of that is, is that, you, you know, that could bite you if you write something that there's not an audience for. Um, and then that's, that's the perpetual struggle. And I go through that still, I write something uh, that's on my mind and I'm like, I have no idea if my, my publisher is going to even want this, but this is entertaining to me. And, and usually it begets <laughs> multiple edits where you're just like, right. all right, you know, make this a little bit more accessible, you know, stop being so like, you know, proud of yourself and, and make it into something somebody actually wants to read. Right. Reader facing. I've, yeah, I've been told reader that. facing. Oh, that's yeah. You gotta, you gotta be reader facing, you know, but it's, but it's an art at the end of the day. And that's why, because, you know, I mean, you've written a lot of books, but there's something about getting all this out that there's something very personal and emotional and meaningful about it that has no commercial value. We know that, but I mean, I try to remind myself, I write stuff that I know no one's ever going to read and it doesn't mean it's not good. And it doesn't mean something to me, you know? Sure. I mean, it's a form of self-therapy for sure. I think all writing is, I think right. like, I, I, yeah. And, and, and you're right. That's, there's that fine line in terms of that outpouring of emotion or, or, uh, you know, revelations that might be highly personal cloaked in your characters. Um, that is, that is healthy and good for your own soul. And then your editor saying, yeah, I'm kind of bored with this person. <laughs> I mean, they whine too much. <laughs> you know, you're like, okay, that, and I remember the night I was writing that chapter, I was right. feeling sorry for myself or whatever, and you got to go cut that out. But usually, for me, I usually need not only a lot of edits, but I need, you know, other eyes on right. it to, because you're so close to it, you can't, you don't have that perspective anymore. Right. And that's the, that's the biggest benefit, you know, is somebody, you know, trying to keep a reader facing and, you know, because it, it's hard to see the forest for the trees and other cliche when you're yeah. doing something like that, especially because it's also personal. It is so know? personal. Well, and I think particularly in your case where you are, you know, intertwining a lot of your own personal history um, uh, in it, you know, it's, but I think that's also so good. Like there's, there's something about writing that, forces you to be so vulnerable just the act of sharing whether it's complete fiction or whether it's tied to your own past and i think that is so healthy because the more and more and more you do it the less you care about what people actually think and and after a while you're like i just put this out there this is me you know yeah, oh, yeah. Awe to the world and and it doesn't hurt anymore when you tell me it's terrible <laughs> Yeah, it takes a while to get there. Oh, it does. And that's that's a hard... And I didn't realize with that first book that I put all my personal business out there in book one. I mean, that's, you know, it's right. like, like well, what was I thinking? I mean, like I said, I just reread and I was like, well, what was I thinking? You know? Yeah. But, 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 but everyone changes over time. What you write 10 years ago is exactly. totally different than what you write now. And it's <laughs> and, and that's good too. You got to honor that person, uh, you know. At that's where time. I was at that point in time. And that's what I needed. Totally. When, what what was your family's, like, how did your family kind of react to all of uh, that? Well, it was great because, uh, well, first of all, I was scared to let him read it. I didn't let him read it till I I was actually close to it coming right. out. You'll give it to strangers, but you won't give yeah. it to your family. Yeah. When I read that, I go I go to like fourth dimension in the book and say, you know, I won't talk about this with anybody I know, but I'll write about it in a book. I want everyone to, to read. But, you know, they were great because my dad's words were, you don't, you know, you don't, you don't, you're just going to tell us what you're going to do. You don't have to ask us for permission. That was very brave of him. Mm. But, you know, you know, and there's a lot about my mom and I in the book, but she's has showed a lot of grace. And, you know, what they've done is just, you know, supported me and loved me through the whole thing. And that might be the most powerful thing that happened out of the book process. It was, you know, it was just like, you know, you're a person. We got you, you know, and yeah. we're just going to support you. Mm -hmm. So, And not, not all families are like that. <laughs> no, and I think I, in retrospect, you know, that's a... Part of the gift of the process of doing that book. Right. Know? Right. So, I mean, 
I, I assume you're still writing. I, I know you're not doing the college football stuff, but maybe you're still writing short form um, things as well. But now that you're you now that you've written a couple books, like is this like this is what I want to do? I want to write long form. This is where my 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 desire is. Well, you you get this all the time. I, I I'm sure. Like, what are you working on now? And what's yeah. your next thing? Yeah. And how many books have you written? You've written. I've written 13. Um, I've published 10. My first three didn't sell. Um, and I just wrapped up another one. So, but yeah, I, I almost always write novels and I only write short fiction if I'm, if I'm asked to basically. Right. I, I have another book idea, but, uh, what I'm writing right now, I've been asked to like go around and speak about my second book, like be a speaker. Right. And so I don't know if that's what I'm going to go do. That's yeah. what I would like to do. I'm very passionate about that topic. I think I will always write. I don't know if I have another book in me. I might. I yeah. think I do, but I'm at like a I'm at a I'm like at a crossroads right now. And then oh. they want me to take a shot at writing a screenplay for oh. book one. And so um yeah. so I'm that's why I took the season off. I'm gonna get on the jump off point with these two things and see really what's next for me. And then yeah. you know, my kid'll go away, my last kid'll go away to school at the yeah. end of the year. So yeah. I, I feel like I'll probably write another book i'm 55 i'm not i'm way long way from being done but i think i've got another book in me but i really think it's gonna be totally different than the other two if i had to guess and i would love to write about college football again right after this right so, right you could write a novel about college football I've, oh i've thought so much about that but if people cared about <laughs> texas tech football more we would have the best texas tech book ever but <laughs> like and friend we've got to be reader facing apparently so. But the the public speaking thing is fascinating to me because I love public speaking and, and I I've, I've trained in it and I do it as much as I can and I just I just really enjoy it. But it's like writing; it's an art form, right? And it takes a lot of practice and a lot it takes a lot of feedback to to get it down right. So if you and if you have a subject that your people are interested, in, like you do, um, you are going to get engaged and you can make decent money going right. around talking about that subject. But I think to your point, how long does that one subject last? You know, are you going to speak in perpetuity on this one right. thing or do you go for a second or whatever? So, but I think if you can get into that circuit, um, it's, it's amazing how many, what, there's a lot of desire for that. And that's well beyond just small book clubs, you know, large organizations like love oh. having featured speakers who are, Humorous, memoirs, writers, you know, you know, that's just, you could really, you know, TED Talks, that kind of a thing. You yeah. Can really take off. I had no idea. I was just contacted. You know, this my second book's all about letter writing and hope and it's just a story that kind of happened to me that I'm super passionate about. Mm -hmm. But they were like, you know, this will make a great keynote speak, speech. And I, and I like you, I like to speak. I enjoy speaking. I, I, and other than writing, that's probably the thing I enjoy the most. And I had no idea there were all these events that are interested mm -hmm. in hiring people, you know, and, and having a book makes you credible on the subject. I've been told this a bunch of times by the speaking people, right. you know, whether you think it, think it does or not back to imposter, you know, syndrome and people aren't looking for people to hire. They are looking for speakers to hire. Yeah. I mean, this is like, there's, and the way it was plain to me is there's too many stages and not enough speakers. So there's a need for people with a message that can be you know, crafted to fit these different groups, you know, and it's interesting from a writing standpoint, once I write the speech and I'm close to being done with it, you know, I can take the speech and tweak it to the audience, you know, and basically, you know, it's going to be the same little, uh, you know, structure foundation, and then I'll do it different ways. So I'm super interested to see where that takes me because one, I like the message and then it gives me a chance really to talk about, it's kind of the book in speech form, but not really. It's like, what I would do now that the book is four years, you know, not the story is four years old, not the right. book. Right, totally. And, and I think, you know, a lot of aspiring writers don't appreciate, you know, not that you have to be a public speaker as a writer by by any means, but how much it helps, <laughs> you know, right. that how many other things you need to be doing aside from just writing, you know, this, this, this misconception of like, I've written the book, uh, you all do the rest of the work <laughs> is, is such a fallacy because you have to, you know, if you want to, if you really want to get traction, you have to put yourself out there, which is a hard thing for a lot of introverted writers to do. I mean, you're clearly not introverted. So you, it's helpful for you to be able to kind of get up on stage and talk about things and that propels your career. Um, if you just sit and just write, you can, you can be successful, but it's, it's a, it's a much harder slog, I think. No, I think you're right. I didn't understand that. 
getting into it. I didn't understand that it was going to require. Now I like this. Like I like doing all of this. I like it. You know, there's a little bit of pressure with everything, you know, uh, and, uh, but I, I, I enjoy all the engagement and everything, but that's definitely a part of it. You have to really put yourself out there. And then on top of not quite believing in yourself, you have to act like this is the best thing you've ever been a part of, you know, right. like you have to be out there going, this is the best book. You don't, right. you don't have to say that. I've never said that. But, you know, you have to go out there and act like you believe in this. And that's, right. you know. Right. Right. And totally. <laughs> and that's and it, that's funny, too, because when you look at like social media, for example, and you follow different authors and stuff like that, it is such such a balance between me, me, me. Like I see some authors. I'm like, oh, man, you're trying way too hard. And I'm like, am I trying way too hard? Like, right. you know, how do I know? Like it. And and I tend to almost go the other way where I I don't say a lot of things about my book and then I get told by my PR team they got to be posting yeah. more you got to be doing this, and yeah it's it is difficult to to shine the spotlight on yourself when you're not necessarily really <laughs> feeling it. Right. No. And I think that social media thing that's something that I finally got where I consistently post and uh, you know and it's hard though because you don't want to. There is a fine line between like, look at me, look at me. And, you know, like I want to share, like I want to share the story and this is part of what I need to, you know, be successful or progress in this whole process. That's a, that's totally, that's hard. And it's all dependent on who you are too. We each of us have a threshold right. for that. And I, I get to the point where I don't want to be the person where I don't believe my own stuff. Right. And right. and I want to be able to go to bed at night and feel good. And that's where the humor helps me. Because, oh my gosh, social media and humor were meant to be together. Totally. And so I can just paste my head on somebody's body. And that's my post for Wednesday. You know, and people right. follow me, get it. But I, I, that's what I want to do. Right. You know? right. <laughs> well, and I think that's some of the best advice I've ever gotten from from my PR team is like, you don't have to do everything. And find what you like and just focus on that. So for me, that might be my, my newsletter. I'll commit every month to my newsletter and I'll really commit. I'll really you know, write three to 5,000 words on it, you know, but I might not spend much time on Facebook or something like that, Be you know, but it's true because then it comes through. And it also comes through if you're doing stuff that you're clearly not interested in. Because I've seen newsletters that are just like, hey, buy my book. And that's like the extent of the newsletter. And right. that's not doing you any favors. Right. So it is Let's, it's going back to what you said, though, about, you know, you said you ought to write what, what you you know, what you're interested in. And that's hard because can I sell what I'm interested right. in? Right. But, but it's it's back to the same, you know, that's the secret sauce though. Because people are going to, who you are is going to come across and what you really enjoy doing, you know, and that's that's the thing. you got to use that medium. But I think we live in a world where everybody wants a blueprint. Like, here's how you do it. Right. Like, here's how you're happy. Here's how you do this. Here's how, but the truth is all these relationships, including the one with ourselves, the, the voice in our own head between our ears is different for all of us. Right. So they, the, the key is to encourage, like, you're the newsletter guy, you know, and to encourage each other to use those channels to to further what we're trying to do, as right. opposed to everybody trying to do it the exact same way. Totally. And I think it circles back to our first sentences in this conversation was, um, you know, the power of positive thinking. And I, I truly believe that, that if you pursue the joy, uh, meaning write what you want to write, that and and just and have the ability to let go. I'm going to do this. I'm going to put this out there and see what happens. Then good things will happen. As opposed to the blueprint method of like you know what is the exact right way to write a bestseller. Um, because I and, and but it's joyless because you're not interested in what you're doing. Um, I mean that's what's worked for me. I don't know any other way. <laughs> right. Uh, right. But but I but it's uh, there's something about just pursuing the joy more than anything else, and then letting all the chips fall where they may afterwards, and then just being okay with that. Um, that's for me. That's the only thing I know. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that's great advice in life, not just in right. You know, <laughs> that's why I have let go tattooed on my arm. <laughs> oh, that's good. Well, that's the thing. If we could all live that way. You know, and that's that's a hard space to stay in because it's a hard time to be a human being right now. It is, yeah. And I don't want to preach and sound like I'm this person all the time. I struggle no. like everybody else does. No, Wait. no, and I agree. And, and I, and you're very relatable. No, I agree with that though. And I think the other thing is being authentic and saying, "Hey, you know, I screwed this up," you know, or "Hey, you know, 
this has not been perfect. And But that's part of the joy in the ride is that if it was perfect, then it wouldn't be all those twists and turns and all the like, oh my God, what have I done? You know, if that, that that's part of the story, you know, and that's very, I think to everyone else who's out there, I mean, it's so good to know that we're all flawed and messed right. up. And then like, this is beautiful and like the biggest freaking mess I've ever been a part of. Right. Things will Real always life. turn out differently than you expect, but that doesn't mean they're not going to turn out okay. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, well, we're going to wrap up. Before we do, we're going to do a real quick storytelling. Um, this is the storytelling part of the episode. I've chosen three books at random off my bookshelf. You're going to choose one of those, and we're going to choose a random sentence from a random page. I'm going to read that sentence, and that'll be the first sentence in just maybe a two-minute long short story. Um, so I'll read that sentence. You give me the next couple sentences of what happens, then I'll do a couple, and then okay. Great. when it becomes a complete shit show, we'll shut it down. Um, so I have my buddy, uh, Mark Stevens, uh, the fireballer here. So this is, this is, a, you're, I don't know if you're baseball, but this it's a baseball story. Um, Arlen Coben's six years. And uh, these are all signed editions, by the way. And, uh, Gillian Flynn's, uh, gone girl. So choose one of those. I think I'll go with baseball, baseball. for 100. Yes. Baseball for 300. It's a fantastic. Carter. <laughs> <laughs> choose that page between one and 350. 227. Right, we'll do this all one handed. Uh, all right, I'm going to pick a sentence here. There's a lot of dialogue on this. Um, let's see. This is a very basic sentence. So you go with whatever you want with this. The character's name is Gallo. Gallo says goodbye and hangs up. And sits back down on his hotel bed and wonders if he can break into the mini bar because he's going to need a drink now after that conversation. He goes over and kicks the air conditioning unit because it's still not working and looks out at the pool. He decides, why not? I'm going to go out. Steps out of the hotel room, across the parking lot, over to the pool, sits down. The orange fluorescent lights are buzzing over his head and he wonders where he can get a beer. The place was too cheap to have any kind of room service. So he knows he's going to have to do without alcohol for the moment. So he thinks about what else could numb him, numb him to the point that he needed to be numbed. He stares down into the pool, a thin coating of moss covering the top and wonders what it would feel like to hold his breath the same length of time he used to be able to as a kid. Two minutes, he wonders. I wonder if I can hold my breath for two minutes. He sits sits back and thinks, if I jump into the mossy water, will I get an infection? Will I digest something I shouldn't? My mom always told me not to jump in the pond at my grandfather's place, but I always wanted to. He looks around. No one else is there. He takes off his shirt unbuttons it, puts it on the ground. He wonders if he's too close to when he ate last to swim. Takes his pants off and thinks, what the hell? And jumps in. Past the moss. Gets to the bottom of the pool quick because it's shallow. Thinks, now I'm going to hold my breath. He sees the moss floating all around him. and begins to count backwards. He thinks back to the phone conversation and knows he can't numb himself, even in the water. I think we call it there. Yeah. Because that was about to get wicked dark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were, yeah, we were about to get dark. Boy, that, I didn't, yeah, I liked how you caught on to my motel vibe, though, because I, I like a motel. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a real, like, there's something so depressing about traveling and being in a, in, in a motel or a hotel that's sub what you had expected. Oh, uh, wow. I have a specific memory of being in North Dakota in the winter on, on, on a job assignment. And I was one of three people in this hotel, I was told. And I just remember just this overwhelming sense of gloom was so deep within me. And I've never experienced anything like that. It was such a vibe in there, but it's, it's, it's visceral. 
right? Yeah, right. But, uh, but not in a not in a good positive way. So, but I, I made it out of there, and I didn't go swimming or anything. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't have jumped in the water. <laughs> I would have been scared. But uh, right, whatever whatever his name was, the baseball guy. Uh, yeah, he uh, Mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he, he he wasn't afraid. But yeah, it's interesting though because as soon as you said. It wasn't a hotel that had room service. I knew we were on the same page. I should it should have worked back to the ice maker though. It could right. Oh yeah. Something. Right, right. And there, of course, there would have been a body in the ice machine. Yeah. I would say, that's you. You. <laughs> I'm going to try to be funny, and you're going to you're going to have dead people at the boat. Oh, I mean, that is funny. No, it is funny. No, it's totally funny. It makes yeah, it makes me yeah, uh, yeah. Think of a, another story I heard, but anyway, that was well, funny. Amy, Amy, what a pleasure talking to you. And it was uh, it was so great to hear about kind of your journey as 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 a writer and all the cool things that you have uh, lined up. And I'm excited to see uh, what happens uh, cinematically with your first books. Hopefully, that'll all come through. Yeah, and you know that could just be a a, a thing that I got a chance to play around with a screenplay and that's as far as it goes yeah, but, but there's know, something there yeah you just they went out they wouldn't you know you just never know i would never, never thought know. i would have gotten a, a meeting so right, right. there you just, go that's awesome like you said let's be full of joy and and that's you right. know take a stab at stuff and who knows what's going to happen next that's right great talking to you you too i really appreciate the time thank you all right take care amy all right bye bye so that's it. That is my conversation with Amy Wineland Daughters. Um, that was great. That was great. And she, man, she took off with the uh, with the storytelling. I love that. She's just like, I see where this is going. I know what's going to happen. I can see it all. And when that happens during uh, our making it up part, it's always it's always a lot of fun. So I I, I think you got to go check out her website because it's hysterical. Um, she's 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 as funny on paper as she is talking to. Uh, just go to amydaughters.com and you can find out anything about her and buy her books. And while you're online, hop on over to my website, carterwilson.com. You can buy my books. You can see where I'm headed to next. Uh, you can read my newsletters and all or see other episodes of Making It Up. So check all of that out. Um, more episodes coming out soon. I hope you enjoyed this one. I certainly did. Thanks, as always, for watching and or listening. Take care.